So I have a tattoo here of a blueprint of one of John D'Angelico's archtop guitars. He was the godfather of archtop guitar making and made some of the best archtops in the whole entire world. So I thought it would only be appropriate to pay homage to him. My name is Megan Wells, and I build archtop guitars and mandolins. I had been a musician my whole life, and I loved everything about the guitar. I was just completely obsessed with playing music, writing music, and I also was starting to show signs of being obsessed with woodworking. Woodworking and guitars together are the, the two things I, I love the most. It's like, who wouldn't love that? I didn't just grab a spoke shave so I could carve a neck. Like, I just got a, a tool that was a gift from somebody that I love very much. And he is now a part of this. And it's, um, it's the same thing with, with a lot of my tools. It's, I'm not just grabbing a tool to, you know, execute a procedure. It's like these, these tools are, these tools are, we've been through a lot together. We've done a lot. They've taught me a lot. And yeah, they're really special. And then all of my, my curly cues that I get from, you know, carving my necks or carving my tops, I save for my mom, and then she sprinkles them in her garden. So, nothing goes to waste. And she's got her gardens just full of these little cute little curly cues. There's one part of me that wants people to see me in my instruments. There's another part of me that doesn't want anybody to know that I exist. I had one sanding block, well, I have one sanding block, Roundy. Oh no, I'm gonna look crazy. <laughs> um, but let's get Roundy out. Let me just show you Roundy. Um, and so this is Roundy. Roundy has an uncanny ability of disappearing because he rolls away all the time. Um, but I've had Roundy for probably 10 years. Um, and uh, one time I went to a guitar show in Montreal and I brought Roundy. I was like, I, Roundy deserves to be here just as much as I do. Like Roundy did a lot more work than I did. So Roundy, Roundy came to Montreal, um, you know, and sometimes it's like, yeah, it's like sometimes Roundy's having a good day. Sometimes Roundy's having a bad day. It's like me. Just like all of us. So, um, I mean, I'm just observing. I don't make this stuff up. I swear this is, oh my gosh. Maybe it's also because I'm here alone a lot. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I've worked really, really hard for a long time to learn how to make great instruments. I will work on that for the rest of my life. That's not something that I'm gonna achieve at 35 or, or for, you know, maybe when I'm 70, I will have something figured out, but this is a lifelong journey.
when I was in my middle 20s, I would be introduced in a social situation like a party. And uh, people say, oh, uh, meet Bruce Sexauer. Uh, he's a luthier. And I would say, <laughs> this is so embarrassing, uh, well, actually, I'm a musician. <laughs> I would say that. And, and I would embarrass myself every time because I, you know, but it's, I was compelled to say it because that's what I wanted to be. Eventually, I gave up because the world identified me as Bruce Sexauer Luthier and gave me money to be it. I think that there are 23 guitars in this room. Is that enough? <laughs> and there are five out in shops. So I own 28 of my own guitars right now. That's a little scary when I think about it. You're a collector. I am a collector, <laughs> and I only collect one maker. I used to worry about owning too many of my guitars, but uh, I don't have any of the guitars I owned five years ago, so it can't be that bad. <laughs> what happened to them? People beat down my door to buy them. All, all woods have a unique tonal signature. Uh, the truth is, it's very, very subtle. They all sound like guitars. You almost have to compare them directly or be an expert, have played a lot of guitars to be able to hear it or identify it. The most tragic story in, in modern guitar making history is probably uh, Madagascar Rosewood, where the island of Madagascar uh, has been 90% shaved. Personally, I'm not comfortable buying a new Madagascar rosewood, or, nor, frankly, uh, if I didn't know the provenance of it, would I buy new Brazilian rosewood or Pernambuco. Um, I just, I just won't. Guitar making requires a finesse and very little strength from one end to the other except this one part. And there are ways to do this without having to use your muscles, but if I built, if I did this process all the time, if this is all it was, by God would I be built. This guitar, by the way, now that we have all the binding on, it's very resonant, makes a great drum. At this point, when I can tap on a guitar like this, I, I know a whole lot about how good the guitar is going to be. And um, I declare this guitar a winner at this point, though when we put the strings on, that's when we really know. This is called a blind dovetail mortise, and uh, it's a mechanical joint. It will hold the guitar. This has not been fit yet, uh, which is to say that the, the line here that you can probably see uh, will disappear. This will appear to be a perfect joint. I feel like I'm, a, like I'm flying an airplane when I do this. In the ocean, going to land on an aircraft carrier, and the aircraft carrier is moving and the airplane has to land just so. Once you hit the deck, you've got to be right, and that's just what happens here. Once I'm done carving, it should be perfect. And if, of course, I carve too much away, <sighs> in flamenco dance, and I, I, I like to say when, when they're dancing and they go boom, man, you feel that sparking energy. That's the manifestation of duende, which is the spirit of the dance. And it can be viewed as a fairy or, or you know, a, a metaphysical force. Um, the Spanish luthiers believe that the guitar can be built uh, as a habitat for the spirit of Duende. It's where Duende lives. I can tell you that if you call yourself a master in this industry, people will walk away from you because that's not something we get to decide. And the fact that I have spent my life pursuing mastery as a luthier and you can say that. Oh yes, I'm pursuing mastery as a luthier. That's my game. That's not embarrassing. If I'm not arriving yet, uh, I 
better step it up. <laughs> we are at Luthier's Mercantile International. Um, I've been working here for the past two and a half years, and we supply everything that a guitar builder needs to build a guitar. Luthier's Mercantile takes a lot of pride in the fact that they make sure all of their materials are ethically sourced and harvested. Sometimes you just come in the morning and there's just a whole new a couple of pallets of wood. Here we have some Indian laurel. Um, we have some Indian rosewood backs and side sets. <laughs> The fact that my part-time job is directly related to what I have been studying for the last 14 years kind of blows my mind. I mean, because I, I was, I mean, I was working at a coffee shop for four years before this, and I kind of always thought that it was going to be, I was going to have to do something like that on the side in order to keep my bills paid and, you know, feed the wood fund. Every morning when I'm here, by 7.05 or so, I'm firing off this dust collection and I'm so thankful and it makes me feel like the luckiest girl in the whole world. Very, very thankful. the end of the day when you pull out a bucket of dust and you see everything you've accomplished that day it is just it's it's a wonderful feeling um, it really makes you feel like you've really done a lot that day it's very special there we go look at all that dust it's a thing of beauty and depending on the different woods you sanded that day. There's all these different layers of dust that are different colors and it's just, it's just so naturally beautiful and you can just see, it's almost like a timeline of what we did that day. And um, it's, it's naturally just very beautiful and very rewarding. So um, it's an honor.